Good evening. I see people starting to log into the webinar uh, and we'll get started relatively quickly. So my name is Esther Peters. I am the Associate Director at the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies at the University of Chicago. And I'm really excited to be able to welcome everyone uh, to tonight's event uh, with Miriam Udal as part of our series, Series of Voices. This is an author-centered series of readings and conversations on books on uh, or from Central and Eastern Europe, Russia, Central Asia, and the Caucasus. Our long-term partner for this series is the Seminary Co-op Bookstore, the first not-for-profit bookstores whose mission is book selling. Although the stores remain closed to the public, they are fulfilling orders and supporting sales for virtual events like this one through their website, semcoop.com. When you place your order, you can choose from shipping, delivery to local area codes or curbside pickup. Tonight's event uh, is also supported by the Gemunder Family Foundation and co-sponsored by the Joyce Z and Jacob Greenberg Center for Jewish Studies as an interdivisional center, uh, interdivisional and interdisciplinary center at the University of Chicago in the divisions of humanity, social sciences, and the divinity school, whose aim is to nurture dialogue among the many disciplines, scholars, and students engaged in Jewish studies at the university. You can find more information about upcoming events uh, in this series and other events that both centers are engaged in on our websites. Uh, which I've provided in the chat box below. Uh, Ceres and the Greenberg Center are pleased to also be co-sponsoring two additional events with Professor Udell in the coming days. Tomorrow at noon, she will be joining the Yiddish Tisch at, uh, uh, as they continue to discuss Labzik, a middle grade children's novel about a leftist dog in New York during the Great Depression. And on Sunday, November 26th, 22nd, sorry, 22nd, uh, at 3 p.m. She will uh, uh, be joining, uh, she'll be leading A Taste of Honey Off the Page, a children's storytelling event where young attendees uh, can explore uh, Yiddish storytelling through movement, art, and poetry. The event is geared for children uh, four to eight, but all ages are welcome. More information about both of these events uh, can be found in the chat box. Uh, hold on one second, as soon as I find my chat box again. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, finally, uh, to get on to tonight's event, uh, we will be discussing Honey on the Page, an anthology of Yiddish stories from around the globe, selected and translated uh, by Miriam Udell, an associate professor of German studies and Jewish studies at Emory University, where her teaching focuses on Yiddish language, literature, and culture, she was ordained in 2019 as a part of the first cohort of the executive ordination track at Yeshivat Maharat, a program designed to bring qualified mid-career women into the Orthodox uh, Rabinate. Sorry about that. Uh, Udell's academic research interests include 20th century Yiddish literature and culture, Jewish children's literature, and American Jewish literature. She is the author of Never Better, the Modern Jewish Picaresque from the University of Michigan Press, She's the winner of the 2017 uh, Jewish Book Award and in, in Modern Jewish Thought and Experience. Honey on the Page, a Treasury of Yiddish Children's Literature appeared in October with New York University Press. You see the book there. And she will be joined this evening in conversation by Jessica Kierzain who teaches Yiddish language as well as courses in Yiddish literature at the University of Chicago. She is also the editor in chief of Ingeveb, a journal of Yiddish studies. If you have a question at any time during their conversation, please enter it in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. Uh, and on that note, welcome to you both and I will turn it over to both of you. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, Esther, for making this event possible. And also thank you to uh, Matthew Wacklin and Nancy Pardee and Amma Rokem who were involved in organizing this event really happy to have you here, Miriam, and uh, to talk to you about your translation. Um, can we start by just, can you tell me how you arrived at the project, how you decided to embark on these translations? Sure. So first, let me just 
thank you, Jessica, and all of your colleagues who worked so collaboratively to put together this virtual visit to Chicago in which I don't even have to put on a winter coat. So um, it's very much appreciated. So I started um, gathering the materials and having the idea for what became Honey on the Page in 2013. I had finished the manuscript for my first book, which was a study of the modern Jewish picaresque and how um, the the Yiddish novel or a genealogy that we can give of the Yiddish novel emerges out of the picaresque tradition. And I think I was looking for something of a palate cleanser. And at that point I had been teaching Yiddish, introductory Yiddish for several years. And I had two very young children. And I was thinking about the fact that my own foreign language education, whether it was the Spanish that I had learned as a child growing up in Miami, or the Hebrew that I studied in college, or the year of Arabic that I took after college, all of these courses had incorporated children's literature, and my Yiddish classes never had. And it made me wonder whether there was any such thing. Did Yiddish just not produce a children's literature? Like, what was up with that? And when I started poking around, I found that there was a real embarrassment of riches, as in I was embarrassed that I didn't realize how many riches there were. They, the books and periodicals, more so the books, but the books were really easy to find because there are um, almost a thousand freestanding books and anthologies that have been digitized um, and posted at the website of the Yiddish Book Center, all freely available, and a resource that the Book Center commissioned probably about 20 years ago, where a group of indefatigable volunteers read through hundreds and hundreds of these books and wrote very brief synopses. So that was a starting place. That was called the Noah Coatsen Library, and it's still available on the Yiddish Book Center website. So when I saw that all of this material existed, I thought, somebody's got to do something with this. We need to start talking about it. Um, because I could see that there were, there were pretty big ideas. And what I came to understand and what I'm thinking about now as I write a critical study as a companion volume is that by tracing Yiddish children's literature, we're really getting an alternate window onto Jewish modernity. And once I sort of began to see that, I thought, okay, somebody's got to create an anthology. And I seem to be the Meshuggah person who's most, uh, most eager to do it. I'm the one rushing in to do it. So I guess, I guess it's me. So I, I wonder, can you conjecture about why it is that no one has done this until now? Do you, why has, has Yiddish children's literature not gotten attention? Well, it's hard to say exactly why something hasn't happened, right? But um, I'm thinking back to my own um, concerns and anxieties as a scholar at the beginning of my career in Yiddish. Um, I was plagued by the sort of anxiety of prestige or status that was very typical of of Yiddish itself, of Yiddish culture itself throughout most of its, um, throughout most of the time that it was a, a vehicle for high culture. And um, once I decided that I really was going to commit and write a dissertation that was mostly, largely about Yiddish, I wanted to make sure that I was engaging the the highest and the best and the, the most, uh, you know, impeccably credentialed authors, and that meant engaging most, mostly male authors, or at that time exclusively male authors in my case, um, and trying to write about a topic that would be kind of unimpeachably sophisticated and, and easy to, to theorize. Um, and it was really a very different point in my own relationship with Yiddish and my own career that I was ready to do a more um, ground up or 
person outward kind of scholarship. And I think that's when I started looking to understand, well, what were, what were women reading and writing? What were children reading? What, were, what was the society putting before its children? Um, and that's how I came to it. So I could imagine a lot of people before me not necessarily coming to that because that didn't come to be their concern necessarily. It's, it's interesting too, because it seems to me that the idea to produce a children's literature is part of Yiddish as a, as a legitimizing Yiddish as a project, right? The, the infrastructure of education right. uh, and so forth. And so it seems to be, and I know that you write a little bit about the kind of nationalism embedded in uh, the, the making of Yiddish children's literature. So in some ways, the, it feels like a project that's about the sort of the solid foundation of Yiddish. It's so much a modern culture that it has a children's literature even. Uh, and yet, much like in my own work where I have encountered uh, critics who say, and even women wrote in Yiddish, and that's the only sentence that there is, I suspect the same might be the case for children's literature where you would have volumes that say, and even there was children's literature, but that's the only sentence that you have. Right, um, that, that is true. So yeah, this, this children's literature as a corpus, as a project, is really rooted in Yiddish cultural nationalism. The desire to be a real nation, even if it was going to be a nation without, a, without an army. Um, and so the literature that we have grows out of the project of Yiddish schooling, which in turn grows out of Yiddish politics and particularly the politics of the left, of those who understood themselves in some way to be part of a secular or secularizing left. And so um, on one hand, there could not be a more foundational set of texts to study. It had to do with um, the, the most aspirational understanding of itself as a, as a cultural vehicle that Yiddish ever came to possess. And on the other hand, it's so easy to marginalize. Just to give you a quick example, there are, um, there are a couple of wonderful studies of the motif of the Jewish boy who grows up to become Pope, which has its roots in the Joseph cycle in Genesis, but then comes to be more fully articulated in a, in a long story, the longest story in the Maisebuch of 1602. And then it has some interesting early modern and fully modern incarnations. And the longest of all of those is Yudel Mark's young adult novella, Der Yiddisher Pipes, the, the Jewish Pope, which is, it's magnificent. It's, it's got everything. It has the, the papal tale. It has um, dueling families in Rome. It has a chivalric romance plot with a knight, a, a rapacious knight who takes a young Jewish maiden captive and, and holds her in his castle. It has, it has heroism. It has uh, the threat of incest. It, it has like everything you can imagine, right? It, it has everything. And yet, the scholarship on this motif doesn't mention the Yudala, presumably because, you know, who paid attention to children's literature? It kind of flew under the, the radar. Um, so I think that that's something that we can begin to change now that we, we um, beyond a very narrow canon. Yeah. I wonder if you could tell me about how you came to cho choose the particular stories that are a little bit about the, the Kotzen Library, this collection of, of, uh, of descriptions of Yiddish books, but that's actually a very large uh, selection I've, I've looked through in myself for teaching. Yeah. How did you decide on which ones to include? Sure, so I readily admit that I have read through hundreds of really terrible children's <laughs> stories, poems, and plays um, in arriving at my, my 47 gems that I, that I included. But um, I was looking for a number of things. I wanted 
diversity in as many forms as I could find it. I wanted significant representation of um, male authors, of female authors, of work that was published in Europe, published in North America, South America, Israel, um, really kind of wherever I could could find it. Um, not only places of publication, but the settings that were being depicted. So one of the, the kind of hidden gems that I hope to bring to light in this book is an author named Sina Rabinovich, who wrote a book of holiday tales that have exotic settings. And by exotic, I don't mean to participate in exoticizing any place, but rather to say that they're not places that you expect to see portrayed in Yiddish literature. So there's a story that I think maybe we'll talk about later in the hour um, that's set in Casablanca, Morocco. There's a story that's set in Trinidad, um, showing some familiar places in less familiar ways was also important to me. So there's a story that is set on a farm outside of Boston because yeah, there were some Jews who, who farmed. Um, similarly, it, among the, the poultry farmers of Southern New Jersey, there's a story that's set in Tom's River, New Jersey. Um, so taking places, you know, we it's not exotic or strange at all to think of Jews living in New Jersey and even in Southern New Jersey, but um, the, the poultry farms were a very particular moment in American Jewish history. Um, and I can just throw Tina Rabinovich's name into the chat. If I see that, whatever. Uh, um, so let's see, we have our, our diversity of location, our diversity of, of authors, and then the diversity of- Also a religious diversity. Yes, and, and then the other thing is diversity of content, ideology. Um, so the, the structure, the, this really gets into the question of, of how I structured it. Um, I decided to organize the book thematically. It's organized into eight sections. And I followed a scheme that I noticed in several of the anthologies, the early anthologies from the teens and the 20s, which moves roughly from the most distinctively or particularistically Jewish concerns out towards something more and more and more universal. So I start with Jewish holidays and I end up with families because everybody has the experience of family. Great. Can you talk also a little bit about the illustrations that you included in the book? I know that you had um, some of the illustrations are original to this book, and then it looks like a number of the illustrations came from the children's literature that you found as well. Yes. Um, so can you tell us about that? Yeah, so there were, there were two, there were a number of frustrating days on the road to publication. It was, it was hard to get this book published, and I really give props to the New York University Press for, for taking the chance on it and on me. Um, but there were two very happy days. One was when I got the email from the intern who was working on it saying that, yes, we would be able to reproduce some of the original illustrations. So we have absolutely, some, some absolutely brilliant, delightful work. Um, this is a little boy lying in his bed who's being attacked by the letters of the Aleph base of the Hebrew Yiddish alphabet because he hasn't practiced reading Yiddish all summer. Um, and then the, the other extremely happy day was when I finally got the word that yes, we would be able to hire illustrator par excellence Paula Cohen to do not only the cover, but eight original full page images, one for each of those thematic sections. And um, she very generously also agreed to uh, create banner illustrations for the beginning of each, the beginning of each selection. So there's a little banner that goes across the, the page and there's an oval that contains an object, her rendering of an object that's significant in the story. So if I may, I'd love to take our listeners on a little tour of the cover. Um, 
It starts here with the spice box that's in the Sholem Ash story, the magnate of Jerusalem. And out of this very ornate spice box, the stories are wafting upward. So we have the wind that got angry in Moshe Kulbach's story by that name, and the, the brave mom who's out there trying to stop the wind and, and calm down his anger. We have the 1930s fire truck that was sent to rescue Sprinze. Now, Sprinze didn't actually need rescuing. She's a girl who's very passionate about reading, and she'll go wherever she can find a quiet place to enjoy her book without being dragged home by her annoying little sister, Sirke. So Sprinze has actually very resourcefully climbed up to the top of this gas lamp. And you see the neighborhood moms below who are absolutely horrified, who think she's in terrible danger. And they're the ones who summon the fire department. So the fire truck comes to rescue Sprinze, whether she needs it or not. And then striding across the top of the cover, we have the magic lion of Yankov Pot's story about a rabbi who spends a Sabbath with this very tame and friendly lion. And the whole thing is joined together by these rose bushes from the story um, by Yehuda uh, Steinberg, Roses and Emeralds, which is a fable about generosity and its opposite. So, you know, I, I just could not be more delighted with the work that Paula did. I think it's, it's whimsical, it's fun, it draws kids into the story. This is the rabbi riding the magic lion. Um, and it's one of the parts of the volume that I'm, I'm proudest of. And I feel like I can brag about a lot because it didn't involve any effort on my part other than my, my being kind of a nudnik and my having good taste. It's, it's beautiful. And I have to say, as someone who uses this book, not only for scholarship, but also to read with my children, it's, it's essential because I don't think that they would let me pick up a book unless it had illustrations. Um, and so it, it really- That's what I up, told them. You know, That's what I told them and told them and told them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess that kind of actually leads me to the next question that I had, which was about audiences, right? So in your introduction, you actually have two introductions. You have one for young readers and one for adults. Um, and I wonder, like, was it hard for you to think about and navigate between those two audiences? And when you were translating, were you thinking about children and what kinds of rhythms or words or whatever would, would appeal to children? And how does that, how does that influence what you, what you do as a translator? Yeah, absolutely. So I knew all along that if I was going to put the effort into selecting and translating these works, that I wanted them to be able to be a resource for children and families and a, a portal for children into Yiddish and into learning about and taking an, inter an interest in Yiddish. And so I had in mind these two audiences all along. And one of the things that I came to understand, this was actually, this is what made the book so difficult to sell because um, contemporary publishing is very age stratified. There's, there's no such thing as a book for adults and kids. Books are not marketed that way. And one of the things that I came to understand is that that situation itself is both an artifact of a reflecting, but also reinforcing a set of societal reading practices. We have an ideal of parents and teachers and other caregivers reading picture books aloud with children. We might even have a sense of reading transitional books aloud that help children transition to chapter books or, or easy readers. But it seems like where we are now as a culture is that as soon as children are capable of reading on their own, we're, we're kind of sending them off to, to go have their own separate reading experiences. And we don't really have the experience that a lot of pre-modern and early modern families did of a shared reading experience that was not age stratified. So 
you know, you picture the hearth or the oven or whatever was the, the sense of, of literal heat. And you also picture the metaphorical warmth that would fill the room through an elder telling stories or a parent reading a story that might be a folk tale or a fable or a medrash about that week's Torah portion. And all of those are kinds of reading experiences that are deeply ingrained, reading or storytelling experiences that are deeply ingrained in the Jewish past, not only the Jewish past, but certainly within the Jewish community. And if anything, I'm hoping that this book, particularly in this moment of pandemic where we're spending so much time with our families, that this book is a, a way to help us return to some of those earlier practices of being able to share a story, talk about it together, and maybe the adults are understanding it on an additional level um, in a way that there's no need to even fully discuss with kids, um, but that there's, that there's material that the adults and the children are examining together and reacting to, responding to, together. And that's why I talk a little bit in the introduction about an idea of children and adults reading in proximity to each other. I want, it reminds me, I wonder if you've ever thought about or if you have plans to make an audiobook uh, component, just because that's the way um, in, my, in my own family, my kids listen to uh, CDs from the Yiddish Book Center with, with these sort of short stories. Um, and it's a way to experience stories together um, and where we're, we're all receiving them. No one is the one reading them or giving them. And that's a, another a similar kind of thing to what you're discussing. Has I love ever... the idea. I just need to, to find the right partners to make right. it happen. <laughs> Maybe someday. Um, can you... Can you talk for just, we kind of touched on it a little bit, but can you talk a little bit more about the gender politics of translating a book of, of children's literature? So um, has it been difficult to be, for people to take this project seriously? Have you felt like your role as a, as a mother, as a woman has made that either easier because people are more excited to receive children's literature from a woman uh, or uh, more difficult in terms of uh, being taken seriously? Yeah, I think, I think it's both simultaneously. Um, the, the book, I'm grateful to say, the book has actually been selling briskly. Um, and I think that there are a lot of people really eager to receive this content. Um, it was really fun to have my first listicle list article um, up on Kveller.com. And you know, I'm, I've been very uh, frank and unabashed about trying to speak to that, that audience of moms in particular who are choosing reading material to share with their kids. Um, but at the same time, I, I am following this book with the critical study that is pretty deeply theorized. And I think to the surprise of some scholars, particularly older scholars, um, I started working on this project, as I mentioned, in 2013. And I came up for my tenure review and, and was tenured in 2015. And I was very clear that the next area that I wanted to move into exploring after the picaresque was children's literature and that I would be doing something with both a critical component and a translation component. And people said right away, well, I hope you don't expect the translation to count for anything because it won't. And I said, okay, but I'm also, I'm also doing this, this critical thing. And I had um, four different colleagues not all from within Jewish studies, so not to rat anyone out even by implication, but I had four different people say to me, well, I'm fine with you working on children's literature, but I'm concerned that other colleagues or the tenure committee might have reservations about that. It might strike people as slight. Um, so it's definitely something that's come up when I give talks about Jewish children's literature as a heterotopian enterprise. And I, I you know, 
pull out Foucault and I, I contextualize it in terms of, you know, Walter Benjamin's interest in childhood and Michel Foucault's theory of the heterotopia as an other space that somehow sheds light on the main space. And I make the case for childhood and children's literature as an alternate literary space that sheds light on adult literature. Um, I think that people have become more receptive and hopefully will only become more so as this subfield of, of Yiddish and of Jewish literary studies gets more and more firmly established. And I'm, I'm fortunate not to be the only one working on it. We have the wonderful, um, the wonderful monograph that the late Naomi Prower Kadar left us about the periodicals that emerged from the New York Yiddish school systems, after school systems. Um, there's a lot of work being done in Israel and in Europe um, on both Yiddish and Hebrew children's literature. So I'm, I'm very indebted to other scholars who are paving the way. Most of those scholars are female. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that was a challenge with respect to gender is that I offer a header note, a biographical note at the beginning of each selection. And for three of the women whose work I included, the, um, the record, the historical record that I could find in Yiddish, Hebrew, or English, or Spanish, um, the record was very paltry. And I needed to get really creative. Now, fortunately, two of those three female authors produced not only their body of work, but very literary sons. And two of those sons had written memoirs that each devoted a chapter to their mother. So I was able to learn about more about the life of Rachel Shabbat Weinreich, um, who wrote as Rachel Shabbat, um, through reading her son's memoir. I was able to learn more about Polish Canadian poet Ida Maza's work by reading the, the memoir of the memoir and literary study of her son Erwin Massey. Um, so that's a place that I, I had to, to get creative. And then the, the sort of final helper in that process was um, was a group of wonderful librarians, particularly Amanda Miriam Chaya Siegel of the New York Public Library Dorot Division of, of Judaica, who over the course of a single day, through looking at ships manifests and social security records and and all stuck together with, with toothpaste, was able to get me a, a basic biography of um, Malka Shechet, who published in Cuba before moving with her family to the United States. And I was able to contact her surviving son, Rav Maximo or Mordche Shechet, and have a conversation with him that filled in a lot of the biographical details about his mother's life. That's amazing. Um, that's so great. Were there stories that felt to you um, anachronistic, I don't know, in, in, out of touch for today's readers in some way that you still felt like you wanted to include in the volume because it gave the texture of um, the history of Yiddish children's literature? And were there, did you ever feel like hesitations because I don't know, there, there were values that you didn't necessarily want to be educating children into, but you wanted to include it in the, in the anthology anyway? Definitely. So for the most part, I tried to, I tried to confine myself to stories that I thought would teach lessons that we would not find abhorrent today. So, you know, there's a Very said. absolutely delightful story by Leib Kvitko, Vemesis Ismaidele, whose little girl is this, um, that climaxes when a scared little girl who's gotten separated from her mother and lost in the train station regains her confidence because she sees a, a portrait on the wall of her great friend, the great friend to children everywhere, our own Joseph Stalin. And I thought that's, I translated it. I really like the story. 
not because I'm <laughs> at all sympathetic to Joseph Stalin. I just like the way that it works as a story. I like the way that it moves between prose and verse, um, but I, I ended up leaving that one out. Um, speaking of Malcha Sheche, who published in Cuba, there's a story that I include about Lag Boimer. We don't have a lot of children's stories about the holiday of Lag Ba Omer. We don't have a lot of stories published in Cuba. So it's a little bit less sophisticated in literary terms. It, it reads a little bit more like a fun kid's pamphlet about Lagba Omer as a children's day, but I did go ahead and include it because I was, I just thought that the content was, was worth having there and the context was worth having there. Um, some of the stories are, do come under the heading of somewhat problematic faves. Um, I included a, a life of Don Yitzchak Abravanel, the medieval uh, Torah scholar and leader of Iberian Jewry throughout the early Inquisition and up through the expulsion from Spain. And there's a chapter in that story where Abravanel is imagined to kind of uh, metaphorically brush shoulders with a young upstart from Genoa named Christopher Columbus, who is trying to make the case to Isabella and Ferdinand that they should fund a voyage um, for him to go off and, and you know, discover this, this new land and this cheaper way to, to get spices and, and other exciting goods from the East, and that he's going to discover a land that is going to become a refuge for Jews who need a place of refuge years and years later. And that was published, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that was published in 1941. And even though Christopher Columbus is now a really complicated figure to think about and that narrative of him discovering America is repellent to many of us, I felt that there was such poignancy in the idea of looking back through Yiddish speaking Ashkenazi eyes right in the midst of the Holocaust and seeing in the Inquisition and the expulsion, seeing Sepharad through, through that lens and imagining that Amer you know, it's sort of almost like this rabbinic motif of the things that were created um, back in creation, like these objects that would become useful later that were created in the, the time between the sunset and the stars coming out on the sixth day of creation. And it was almost like America was one of those, those useful things that would stand the Jews in good stead, even though we know as people of conscience and sensitive readers that that is if we follow it out all the way to its logical conclusion, that's a way of thinking about America that really diminishes um, and, and undermines Native American experiences. So I, again, I don't think we have to necessarily go all the way to all of the, the dark logical conclusions with kids, but it's something for us to be aware of as responsible adults. I guess my opposite question to this question about problematic faves is the is a question about which stories feel particularly resonant, maybe in this moment or in our times. So uh, I know that that you talked, you wrote about children of the field, the Kipnis story for Ingebeb around Passover uh, wow. this year when we were all in quarantine, and this idea of kind of like hope planted um, and 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 ready to rise up in some future time. I wonder if there are other stories that you wanted to talk about as being particularly resonant today. Yeah, so just to say another word about that story and then very briefly a, a couple more. Um, so that's a story that takes as its starting point a midrash that appears in the Talmud in um, Tractate Sota where there's a, a whole rabbinic elaboration of the Exodus story and of all of the events that led up to the Exodus story. And um, so the it's just a couple it's like a throwaway two lines in the in the Talmud but it it offers this image of the 
baby boys in the time of Pharaoh's Egypt being placed for protective custody in, into these holes in the ground. And Kipnis takes that and he, he runs with it and he talks about, um, he, he picks up the language of the Midrash that these boys were planted in the ground by their mothers. They were cared for by angels who gave them a milk stone and a honey stone. In the, in the Talmud, it's a, an oil stone and a honey stone, but he turns it into milk and honey. He's, a, he's quite the Zionist. Um, and that then when it's time for the Exodus, these children who've been planted in the ground spring up and it's a literalization of the metaphor of a kindergarten, of a, a kindergarten, a garden of children, and that those are the, the proud generation that can stride out from Egypt with Moses into freedom. And so it did have a lot of resonance, this idea of having to kind of sequester our children for their own protection so that later we can emerge, you know, strong and, and unharmed by a very harmful environment. Um, so, so there's that one. There's also a pandemic story called The Mute Princess by Sina Rabinovich, that author that I mentioned earlier. Um, there's a little girl who loses her parents in the pandemic, she loses her voice and she's able to find and appreciate community through the experience of Shabbat and, and lighting the Sabbath candles or seeing the Sabbath candles lit. Um, and then there's one other set of stories that we'll, we'll talk about much more tomorrow in, in Yiddish for those who are able to attend that. Um, and that is Lobzik, this wonderful, clever pup um, published in 1935, the author wrote under the name Haver Paver, and this was published by the International Workers' Order for use in the Ordenschulen, which were the communist-aligned schools. And this set of 12 thematically linked stories takes on economic injustice, racial injustice, um, police brutality, the need for a labor movement and for collective action, the need for, um, for voting and elections as the way to solve the society's problems. It, it's basically current events. Um, and so Labzik, I feel, has a lot of resonance right now. So I see that we don't have very much time and we um, I do want to have time for the Q&A. But before I turn it over to the Q&A, would you do us a favor and read to us uh, Ma Ida Maza's Where Stories Come From as a way of rounding sure. out? Absolutely. So um, Maza was born in 1893 and she died in 1962. She was born uh, south of Minsk and she ended up emigrating to Canada and living in Montreal and being something of a den mother for a lot of Yiddish writers who came through Montreal. Her son recalls that if they needed a meal or, or a place to stay or any sort of help, she would set them up. And this, is, this appears here with this wonderful Chagall-esque illustration. And it's marked at the top, a ballad. Somewhere very far away, where wagons will not go, there stands a little cottage as it stood for years, just so. Sitting quiet and abandoned, doors and shutters bolted shut. Days and years pass, only wind blows through the chimney of the hut. Everybody's known for years, its people all have gone away. Only wind blows in the chimney, not a soul has come to stay. One night, when all are sleeping, and the wind is sleeping too, lights come on inside the cottage, and smoke wafts up the flue. Door and shutter are unbolted. In a corner by a light sits a grandpa learning Torah. A child listens with delight to grandpa's tales of wonder beams, absorbs them through her dreams. Hard by the hearth, a spinning wheel, from silken thread so thin and soft. Grandma spins her lovely stories and with the smoke 
sends them aloft. The smoke takes up the grandma's stories, repeats them to a wind beguiled. On its wings, the wind will spread them, giving some to every child. Thank you, I love it. I love the word beguiled there. A great translation. Um, so I, I think we'll open it up now to questions and see if there are questions from um, the audience. You can write your questions in the Q&A um, box at the bottom of the screen. Um, sure, so I see yeah. some so of there's, these. There's a question about who wrote the story that includes Columbus. Right. Um, so that, that was written, and by the way, hi, I remember when you were really little, I remember all the Steinmetz Silvers when they were really <laughs> little from the Trisha Summer High School program. Um, this story was written by Isaac Metzger, who is best known to American audiences as the translator of the Bintel Brief. So he might be familiar for that reason, but it's, it's Isaac Metzger. Yeah. Um, there's a question about anachronistic themes and what do you think about correcting them in translation? Would you ever touch that? Um, I wouldn't. I, I, would, I would choose a story. In this case, you know, as I said, I didn't include anything where I felt like the message was actually abhorrent. Um, in, for other audiences, I might choose other stories. One of the sort of idle dreams that I'll probably never realize is a follow-up volume of translations called Nicht für Kinder, not for <laughs> children, meaning children's literature that would no way be appropriate today for contemporary children. Um, David Hofstein wrote this fantastic rhyming poem about a really adorable little gray and white kitten, and we have a gray and white Kitty, so you know, I started reading this with high hopes, and it's very lyrical and evocative about the little pink nose and the little triangular ears, and it's a fantastic poem until you get to the stanza where the family goes out and the kitties in the courtyard, and along comes a rapacious eagle and tears the kitten to shreds. And I was sort of like, who gives that to children? <laughs> <laughs> um, and there are other stories with, with a lot of violence, um, but some of them have other things to recommend them. And of course, you know, Grimm's fairy tales had a lot of violence too. Um, the, the ideas that we have now about what is appropriate reading for children have not been ever thus. That's something that is historically and culturally bounded. But I would not, as a translator, alter a text in that way, just as my own personal practice. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question here about um, how writings for children enrich our understanding of the writings of a given author. So many of the authors in, in this book um, not only wrote for children, but also wrote other pieces that are uh, for adults and or would have more of adults in mind. So did you, did, did it feel like this uh, volume would shape how um, you might read those other works? Yeah, it, it really did. Um, so two of those authors, two of the kind of big name authors or recognizable name authors in here, for those who know something about Yiddish, um, would be Sholem Ash and Moishe Kulbach. And as I was working on this, um, that fantastic translation of Zelman Yaner that was introduced by our friend Sasha Senderovich, I, I'm blanking on the translator, um, but it's a beautiful translation of his best known novel, a comic novel of Soviet Jewish life. And I definitely found myself as I read that translation, reading Kulbak as the author of The Wind That Got Angry, which is a story about a tantrum. And it's a story that I think really in a, in a deep way takes the part of the child takes the part of the person um, who is the underdog with less power in, in the situation. Um, Sholem Ash wrote, the, so he, he wrote a volume that was called for, for Youth, and it was marketed as children or probably closer to what we would call young adult literature now. Um, and these stories, they're so sophisticated. Some of them remind me of short stories by Jorge Luis Borges. Um, and 
it's definitely the the same ash, you know, um, mm -hmm. the the sophistication is there. So yeah, absolutely. It, it does then kind of shape how I go back and read some of their other work. That's great. And it connects really well to a question. I'm going to skip over a question because it looks like Nobuto Sato has a question that is similar, but takes it from a different angle, which is um, that some modernist Yiddish writers like Fitgo wrote uh, experimental avant-garde poems that challenge language itself, but children's literature seems, is sometimes seen as sort of the opposite of the avant-garde. Um, and so do you see these two ideas as a contradiction or is there, uh, he says, an underlying logic for them? That is a, that's a really fantastic question. And the underlying logic that I see is that both that kind of um, formal and rhetorical experimentation and the realm of children's literature were conceived of as arenas for play, for a really ludic sense that often comes in. One of the ongoing tensions within children's literature altogether, not just in Yiddish or in the Jewish world, but kind of one of the, the deep tensions within um, and not even so much the critical scholarship, but just the production of children's literature is whether that literature should tend toward mimetic representation of kind of everyday reality that the children live and that stories should kind of represent familiar experiences in a very straightforward way, or whether it should be whimsical and fantastical and this kind of other realm. So and it moves back and forth. And occasionally you'll get a single author who, who works somewhat in both veins. And I tried my best to represent both of those impulses in the, in the anthology. That's another form of diversity that maybe I should have mentioned before. But I think that for those who are working in that kind of um, whimsical spirit, the avant-garde is not at all far away. Um, it's, it's very close at hand. Yeah. Um, Sonia Gollins has a question hi, about, Sonia. <laughs> about uh, how Yiddish literature has often been interpreted in different ways by different registers of readers. Um, and she says, you also hinted at the political stakes of children's literature. So can you talk a bit more about how, uh, maybe give an example of a particular text that could be understood on different levels and what some of those levels are? Absolutely. So um, just because you use the word register, I'll mention something that I point out I think I remember to point out in the introduction that when Yiddish literature for children starts to take shape in the teens and then into the 20s, there isn't yet a distinctive register. There isn't a child speak, which is probably what, what you know, David Roskies would, would call it child speak. That doesn't exist yet. Um, and so we'll find a register of vocabulary that's very lofty, very lyrical, you know, why say that a field is sad or lonely if you can say that it's desolate, right? And so that raises interesting questions for a translator now that we are in a society with a somewhat simpler register that we usually use to address children. Do you keep desolate or do you make it into a sad and lonely field? Um, so to give an example, and this is also, this ends up being the first story in the volume, and it's also one of the earliest stories that I translated when I think I was hewing or trying to hew very, very closely to the text as written, um, Janke Fichmann's Sabbath in the Forest. So this is a wonder tale in this distinctively Yiddish uh, mode where the, the sort of Russian type wonder tale specifically becomes a Sabbath tale. It becomes a tale about observing the Sabbath under vulnerable or compromised conditions. And so Lipa the tailor is an itinerant patcher. He lives in a shtetl, he walks through the forest, which is always the place of uncertainty and indeterminacy, right? In, in Yiddish and other Eastern European literatures. And he goes to the um, non-Jewish hamlets, to the derfer during the week, where he patches and he turns coats to extend their life. And he does this very humble sort of um, 
of tailoring work. And he makes a big point of always starting out early on Friday to get home in time for the Sabbath because he hardly knows all of the prayers. Um, he's not learned. He doesn't have access to any sort of elite texts. So how can he, a simple tailor, find um, God's favor by being very punctilious in his Sabbath observance? And one Friday he wakes up and he, he realizes that a snowstorm is coming and everyone's talking about it and they say, you shouldn't leave, you know, you shouldn't travel in this, it's going to be terrible. And he has to get home for the Sabbath. And he says, I have a great God who will protect me. This isn't my first time walking in the snow. And so he starts out and the wind is picking up and it gets worse and worse. And the, you know, there's a, the, there are like ice crystals pelting his face and he comes to the forest and with every step, his feet are sinking into this deep snow. And at one point he falls and he has a hard time picking himself up and it's getting later and later and darker and darker. And finally he realizes he has to daven mencha. He has to pray the afternoon service and then he has to make a decision. Is he going to keep going and try to make it home and be safe? Or is he going to put down his pack because carrying on the Sabbath is forbidden and just stop and observe the Sabbath where he is. And so he stops for the ladder, he stops. And as soon as he makes the decision, a palace made of marble looms up before him and it has these beckoning Sabbath candles in the window. And so he approaches and with some trepidation, he enters and he goes, he, he finds himself in a room with um, everything crystal, crystal candlesticks. And he goes through that room and there's a door and there's a second chamber and everything now in the second room is silver and in the third room it's gold. And he proceeds through six rooms corresponding to the six days of the week. And in the sixth room, it's all diamonds and, and inlaid with fine jewels. And finally in the seventh room, he's welcomed into a congregation of zikanim, of elders who appear to have been waiting for him. And he spends the most splendid Sabbath of his life in their company. So a child is reading this and not to give away too much, there's a happy ending. Great, fine. An adult is reading this, two things. One, is this a Jewish version of the little match girl? Is this some sort of a representation of the afterlife that can't be enjoyed um, during his lifetime, but that now is, is to be enjoyed after his death? So that's you know one way that adults might read it differently than children. And number two, what the heck is a cultural Zionist doing, right? a secularist doing, writing a story that um, celebrates very traditional punctilious Sabbath observance? And he's not the only one. Yankov Pot does the same thing with the magic lion. So what are these writers doing celebrating this, this halachic punctilio? Well, if we stop and think about it, if you say that God owns one-seventh of your time, then that means that your capitalist boss doesn't own one-seventh of your time. So the image of the Sabbath becomes almost a, a thought technology, if you will, for articulating the value of, of rest and of you know, the goals of the labor movement of securing dignity and rest for the worker in this very deeply traditionally Jewish Kugel and gefilte fish scented way. That's amazing. There's a couple of our questions, but also we're, we're kind of out of time. Oh, so hi, think, Anna, Lena. Hi, Nama. <laughs> so um, I'm sorry to skip over some of them, but I do think I want to get to uh, uh, this last question, which is, um, do you have any more sequels or volumes coming up? Do you, what are, what, uh, will you do more translating of, of Yiddish children's literature? Um, yes, give me world enough and time. In 2019, <laughs> um, I held a second fellowship at, at translation fellowship at the Yiddish Book Center. And I'm translating Lobzik, all 12 chapters of him. And I think that Lobzik really, really wants to be a graphic novel. So I'm starting to, you know, see if I can find a 
partner for that. I think Lopzik also parts of him might eventually want to be animated. So I think that Lopzik has a lot to say to the world right now. I'm also working on this critical study. And um, the other big news about Lopzik is that hopefully this spring, even during the pandemic, Theater Emory is going to be offering an adaptation and some kind of a production that we might be able to enjoy remotely um, based on the Lubzik stories. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation and I'm really glad that we have two other events coming up where we can continue to learn from you. Uh, and just to remind everyone that Friday at noon, tomorrow at noon, uh, Miriam will be joining the Yiddish Tish to talk about Lobzik and also presumably other Yiddish uh, children's literature um, in Yiddish. If you want to participate in that, you can write to me and I'll put my email address in the chat and I can get you the, the Zoom link. So if you don't have that yet, please do write to me um, so that you can come. It will happen in Yiddish. Uh, and on Sunday afternoon at three o'clock, um, there will be a storytelling event geared at families and children. Um, the, the target audience is children four to eight and their families, but as we have discussed, uh, Yiddish children's literature is not just for children and, um, and everyone is welcome to, uh, to come join us for that. I'm really looking forward to that um, as well. So uh, thank you, it's been really a pleasure. I'm so glad that uh, we were able to do this. Thank you so much, Dr. Kazane, for these really um, just illuminating questions. I have so appreciated being in conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for coming and thank you to Jessica and Miriam for such a wonderful conversation and to everyone who put in questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all, they were great. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, uh, the links uh, and Jessica's email, if you're interested in Yiddish Tish, are in the chat box. And you can link also to find that same information at the series website uh, for upcoming events, either email or registration information for the events coming up on Friday and on Sunday. So again, thank you to both of you uh, for engaging in this conversation. It was wonderful. Thank you to everyone who attended. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. So. And with that, I'll say goodbye on Bye, myself. thank you.